Part Three of Astounding Stories, January 1930. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathy Wright. Astounding Stories, January 1930. Chapter 3. Ten Miles Underground. What I was going to say when we were interrupted was, Can you beat it? Jimmy Dodd observed, with admirable sang -froid. They were still seated on the red grass, gazing about them at what looked like an illimitable plain, and upward into depths of darkness. It was warm, and the light furnished by what appeared to be luminous vegetation was about that of twilight. On every side were clumps of trees and shrubs, which formed centers of phosphorescent illumination, but for the most part the land was open, and here and there human figures appeared, moving with head down and arms hanging earthward. "'No, I'm damned if I can,' said Tommy. "'What happened to you after we crashed?' "'Why, first thing I knew, I found myself riding on the back of a fossil beetle, "'apparently one of the Curculeonidae,' said Dodd. "'Never mind being so precise, Jimmy. Let's call it a beetle. Go on.' "'They set me down inside the hole and seemed to be investigating me, the whole swarm of them. "'Of course I thought I was dead and come to my just reward.' especially when I saw those beaks. Then one of them began tickling my face with its antenna, and I drew up my fur collar. They didn't seem to like the feel of the fur, and after a while the whole gang started hustling me back again, like a nest of ants carrying something they don't want outside their hill. And then you bobbed up. Well, my opinion is you saved your life by pulling up your collar, said Tommy. "'Looks to me as if it's a case of the survival of the fittest, "'said fittest being the insect, "'and the human race taking second place. "'You know what the humans here live on, don't you? "'No, what? "'Shrimps, as big as poodles. "'If you'd seen that girl and the old man getting outside them, "'you'd realize there seems to be a food shortage "'in this part of the world. "'Say, "'Where in thunder are we, Jimmy?' "'Haven't you guessed yet, Travers?' asked Dodd, a spice of malice in his voice. "'I suppose this is some sort of big hole on the side of the South Pole, with warm vapors coming up. Maybe a great fissure in the earth, or something.' Jimmy Dodd's grin, seen in the half-light, was rather disconcerting. "'How far do you think we dropped just now?' asked Dodd. "'Why, "'I'd say several hundred yards,' replied Tommy. "'What's your estimate?' "'Just about ten miles,' answered Dodd. "'What? You're still crazy. Why, we slowed up.' "'Yeah,' grinned Dodd. "'We slowed up. We're inside the crust of the world. That's the long and the short of it. The earth we've known is just a shell over our heads.' "'Yeah? Walking head downward, are we?' Then why don't we drop to the center of the earth, you damn fool? Because, my dear fellow, you can swing a pailful of water round your head without spilling any of it. In other words, our old friend centrifugal force. The speed with which the earth is rotating keeps us on our feet, head downward. To be precise, the center of earth's gravity lies in the middle of the hollow sphere, of course, but the counteraction of centrifugal force throws it outward to the middle of the ten-mile crust. That's why we slowed down after we were halfway through. We were moving against gravity. And what's up there? Or down there? Or whatever you call it, asked Tommy, pointing to what ought to have been the sky. Nothing. It's the center of the tennis ball though I imagine it's pretty near a vacuum when you get up a mile or so 
owing to the speed of the earth's rotation, which forces the heat into the shell. "'You mean to say you actually believe that stuff you've been handing me?' asked Tommy, after a pause. "'Then how did human beings get here? And those damn beetles? And why's the grass red?' The grass is red because there's no sunlight to produce chlorophyll. The inhabitants of the deep sea are red or black, almost invariably. In the case of the humans, they've become bleached. My belief is that the man and woman we saw, and those, he pointed to the vague forms of human beings who moved across the grass, gathering something, are survivors of the primitive race that still exists as the Australians. Undoubtedly, one of the branches of the human stock originated in Antarctica at a time when it enjoyed a tropical temperature, and was the land bridge between Australia and South America. "'And the beetles?' asked Tommy. "'Ah, they go back to the days when nature was in a more grandiose mood,' replied the archaeologist enthusiastically. "'That's the most wonderful discovery of the ages.' The world will go crazy over them when we bring back the first living specimens to the zoological parts of the great cities. But, Dodd went on, speaking with still more enthusiasm, of course, this is only the beginning, Tommy. There are ten million species of insects, according to Riley, and it is inevitable that there must be hundreds of thousands of other survivals from the age of the great saurians, perhaps even some of the saurians themselves. So who knows but that we may discover the ancestor of the extinct monotremes, the rhynchocephalia, the pterodactyls, hatch a brood of apiornis eggs. And, said Tommy tartly, how are we going to get them back? Apart from the little problem of getting out of here ourselves, don't let's worry about that now, answered Dodd. It will take ten years of the hardest kind of labor, even to begin a classification of the inhabitants of this inner world. I could sit down forever and... But Jimmy Dodd rose to his feet as a pair of antenna whipped around his neck and jerked him boldly upward. One of the monster beetles was standing upright behind them and by its gestures it evidently meant that Dodd and Tommy were to join the crowd of humans in the offing. As Dodd turned upon it with an indignant show of fist, one of the antenna whipped off his fur coat and stung him painfully with the bristle-like attachment at the end. It was a painful moment when Dodd and Tommy realized that they were powerless against the monstrous beetles. Tommy tried the uppercut, with which he had knocked out the deceased monster, but the jerks of the present beetle's head were infinitely faster than the movements of his fists, while the antenna had a whip-like quality about them that speedily convinced him that discretion was the card to play. Under the threat of the curling antenna, Tommy and Dodd moved in the direction of the slowly circulating humans. Numerous tiny rodents which evidently kept the red grass short, scampered away under their feet. The beetles made no further effort to force them on, but now they could see that a number of the monsters were stationed at intervals around a wide circle, keeping the humans in a single body. "'Good Lord!' ejaculated Tommy, stopping. "'See what they're doing, Dodd? "'They're herding us! "'Like cowboys herd steers! "'Look at that!' One of the herd, a male with a long beard, suddenly broke from the herd, bawling, and flung himself upon a beetle guard. The antenna shot forth, coiled around his neck, and hurled him a dozen feet to the ground, where he lay stunned for a moment before arising and rejoining his companions. "'But what are they looking for?' demanded Dodd. Tommy had not heard him. He had stopped in front of one of the luminous trees and was plucking a fruit from it. Jimmy, ever see an apple before? he asked. If this isn't an apple, I'll eat my head. It certainly was an apple, 
and one of the largest and juiciest that Tommy had ever tasted. It was the reddest apple he had ever seen, and would have won the first prize at any agricultural fair. "'And look at this!' shouted Tommy, plucking an enormous luminous peach from another tree. They began munching slowly, then, seeing one of the beetle guards approaching them, they moved into the midst of the crowd. "'Did you notice anything strange about those fruit trees?' inquired Dodd, as he munched. "'I'll swear they were monocotyledonous, which, after all, is what one would expect. Still, to think that the monocotyledons evolved the familiar droops, or stone fruits, on a parallel line to the dicotyledons, is amazing. A box on the ear, like the kick of a mule's hoof, jerked the last word from his lips as he went sprawling. He got up to see the girl standing before him, intense disgust and anger on her face. She snatched the fruits from the hands of the two Americans and hurled them away. It was evident from her manner that she considered such diet in the highest degree unclean and disgusting. Also that she considered herself charged with the duty of superintending Tommy's and Dodd's education, but especially Dodd's. Taking him by the arm, she propelled him into the midst of the groping humans. She released him, stooped, and suddenly stood up, a shrimp about eighteen inches long in her hand. Towering over Dodd by six inches, she took his face in her hands and began caressing him. Then, seizing his jaw in her strong fingers, she pried them apart and popped the tail end of the shrimp into his mouth. Dodd let out a yelp and spat out the love gift, to be rewarded with another box on the ear by the young Amazon, while Tommy stood by, convulsed with laughter, and yet in considerable trepidation, for fear of being forced to share Dodd's fate. For the girl was again holding out the tail end of the crustacean, and Jim Dodd's jaws were slowly and reluctantly approaching it. But suddenly there came an intervention, as the strident rasping of the beetle legs was heard in the distance. Panic seized the human herd, groveling for shrimps in the sandy soil with its tufts of red grasses. Milling in an uneasy mob, they cowered under the lashes of the antenna of the beetle guards, which sacrificed their backs through their hair garments whenever any of them tried to bolt. Nearer and nearer came the beetles, louder and more penetrating the shriek of their rasping legs. Now the swarm came into sight, rank after rank, of the shell-clad monsters, leaping fifteen feet at a bound with perfect precision, until they had formed a solid phalanx around the humans. Tommy heard sighs of despair. He heard muttering, and then he realized, with deep thankfulness, that these human beings, degraded though they were, had a speech of their own. In the middle of the front line appeared a beetle a foot taller than the rest. That it was either a king or a queen was evident from the respect paid it by the rest of the swarm. At its every movement a bodyguard of beetles moved in unison, forming themselves in a group before it and on either side. There would have been something ludicrous about these movements, but for the impression of horror that the swarm made upon Tommy and Jim Dodd. Hitherto both had supposed that the hideous insects acted by blind instinct, but now there could no longer be any doubt that they were possessed of an organized intelligence. The strident sounds grew louder. Already Tommy was beginning to discover certain variations in them. It was dawning upon him that they formed a language, and a perfectly intelligible one. For, as the note changed about a half semitone, two of the monsters left the side of their ruler and reached the two men with three successive leaps. Their movements left no doubt in either Tommy's or Dodd's mind what was required. 
the two strode hastily toward the assemblage and stopped as the antenna of their guards came down in menacing fashion it was light enough for tommy to see the face of the ruler of the hellish swarm and it required all his powers of will to keep from collapsing from sheer horror at what he saw for despite the close-fitting shell the face of the beetle king was the face of a man a white man jim dodd's shriek rang out above the shrilling of the beetle legs bram it's you it's you my god it's you bram chapter four bram's story a sneering chuckle broke from Bram's lips. "'Yes, it's me, James Dodd,' he answered. "'I'm a little surprised to see you here, Dodd, but I'm mighty glad. Still insane upon the subject of fossil monotremes, I suppose?' The words came haltingly from Bram's lips, as from those of a man who had lost the habit of easy speech. And Tommy, looking on and trying to keep in possession of his faculties, had already come to the conclusion that the sounds were inaudible to the beetles. Probably their hearing apparatus was not attuned to such low vibrations of the human voice. Also, he had discovered that Bram was wearing the discarded shell of one of the monsters. He had not grown the shell himself. It was fastened about his body by a band of the hair cloth, fastened to the two protuberances of the elytra, or wing cases, on either side of the dorsal surface. The discovery, at least, robbed the situation of one aspect of terror. Bram, however, he had obtained control of the swarm, was still only a man. Yes, still insane, answered Dodd bitterly, insane enough to go on believing that the polyprotodontia and the Dasyuridae, which includes the Paramelidae, or Bendicoots, and the Banded Anteaters, or Myrmacobidae, are not to be found in fossil form, for the excellent reason that they were not represented before the Upper Cretaceous period. You lie! You lie! screamed Bram. I have shown to all the world that the Phascolotherium, Amphitherium, Amblotherium, Spallocotherium, and many other orders are to be found in the upper Jurassic rocks of England, Wyoming, and other places. You, you are the man who denied the existence of the Nautotherium of the marsupial lion in Pleistocene deposits. You denied that the Dasyuridae can be traced back beyond the Pleistocene. And you stand there and lie to me when you are at my mercy? For God's sakes, don't aggravate him, whispered Tommy to Dodd. Don't you see that he's insane? Humor him, or we'll be dead men. Think what the world will lose if you are never able to get back with your specimens, he added craftily. But Dodd, whose eyes were glaring, said a sublime thing. I have given my life to science, and I will never deny my master. With a speech which, however, was evidently inaudible to the beetles, Bram leaped at Dodd and seized him by the throat. The two men fell to the ground, the ponderous beetle-shell completely covering them. Underneath they could be seen to be struggling desperately. All the while the beetle-horde remained perfectly motionless. Tommy thought afterward that in this fact lay their brightest chances of escape, if Bram's immediate vengeance did not fall on them. Either because Bram was not himself a beetle, or because in some other way the swarm instinct was not stirred, the monsters watched the struggle with complete indifference. At the moment, however, Tommy was only concerned with saving Dodd from the madman. He got his foot beneath the shell, then inserted his leg, using his whole body as a lever, he succeeded in turning Bram over on his back. Then, and only then, the swarm rushed in upon them. Then Tommy realized that he had touched one of the triggers that regulated the beetle's automatism. 
In another instant, Bram would have been torn to pieces. The needle beaks were darting through the air. The hideous jaws were snapping. Bram's yells rang through the cavern. Dodging beneath the avalanche of the monsters, Tommy got Bram upon his feet again. The beetle stopped, every moment arrested. Bram's hand went into the pocket of his tattered coat. There came a snap, a flash. Bram had ignited an automatic cigarette lighter. Instantly, the monsters were scurrying away into the distance, and Tommy had another clue. The beetles, living in the dimness of the underworld, could not stand light or fire. He ran to where Tommy was lying face upward on the ground. His face was badly scarred by Bram's nails, and the blood was spurting from a long gash in his throat made by the sharp flint that was lying beside him. He had some time before discarded his fur coat. Now he pulled off his coat, and, tearing off the tail of his shirt, he made a pad and a bandage, with which he attempted to staunch the blood and bind the wound. It must have taken ten minutes before the failing heart force enabled him to get the bleeding under control. Dodd had nearly bled to death. His face was drawn and waxen, but because the pulsation was so feeble, the artery had ceased to spurt. Then only did Tommy take notice of Bram. He had been squatting near, and Tommy realized that he had unconsciously observed Bram put some sort of pellets into his mouth. Now he realized that Bram was a drug fiend. That was what made him walk out of the Greystoke camp in the storm. Bram got up and came toward them. "'Is he dead?' he whispered hoarsely. "'I—I I lost my temper. You two—I don't intend to kill you. There—' There's room for the three of us. I've got, I've got plans of the utmost importance to humanity. I don't think much of the way you've started to carry them out, answered Tommy bitterly. No, he's not dead yet, but I wouldn't give much for his chances, even in the best hospital. The best thing you can do now is to go to hell and take your beetles with you, he added. Bram, without replying, raised his head and emitted from his throat the shrillest whistle that Tommy had ever heard. The response was amazing. Rasping out of the darkness came eight beetles in pairs. Instead of leaping from an upright position, they trotted in the manner of horses, on all fours, their shells, which touched at the edges, forming a solid surface, gently rounded in the center, so that a man's body could lie there and fit snugly into the groove. "'Help me get him up,' said Bran. Trust me, I'll do my best for him. If we leave him here, they may kill and eat him. I can't trust all those beetle guards. Tommy hesitated a moment, then decided to follow Bram's suggestion. Together they raised the unconscious man to the beetle shell couch. Bram seated himself upon the boss of one of the beetle shells in front, and Tommy jumped up behind. Next moment, to his amazement, the trained steeds were flying smoothly through the air at a rate that could not have been less than seventy-five to eighty miles an hour. Tommy's shell seat was not a bed of roses, but he hardly noticed that. He was thinking that if Dodd lived, they should be able to turn the tables. For unknown to Bram, he was in possession of the cigarette lighter, which he had picked up and which Bram, in his agitation, had forgotten. It was full of petrol, or some other fluid of a similar nature, which Bram must have obtained from some natural source within the earth. And in an emergency Tommy knew that he had the means of keeping the beetles at bay. They had traveled per for perhaps an hour when a faint light began to glow in the distance. It grew brighter, and a roaring sound became audible. A turn of the track that they were traversing and the light became a glare. A terrific sight met Tommy's eyes. Out of the bowels of the earth, actually out of the crust beneath their feet, there shot a pillar of roaring flame, of intense white color, and radiating a heat that was perceptible even at a glance of several hundred yards. 
The beetle steeds dropped gently to the ground, then halted. Bram got down, grinning. "'Nicely trained horses, what?' he asked. "'By the way, you have the advantage of me in names. Who, and what are you?' Tommy told him. "'Well, Travers, it looks as if we're going to be companions for some time to come, and I quite admit you saved my life back there, so we don't want to start with secrets. This is a natural petrol spring, which has probably been burning undiminished for ages. My trained beetles are blind. You didn't happen to notice I'd cut off their antenna. But the rest of the swarm daren't come near it, so that makes me their master. Pretty trick, what, Travers? I'm the lord of the flame down here, and I'm using my advantage. But don't get the idea of supplanting me. There are lots of other tricks you don't know anything about, and I'll have to trust you better before. And he broke off and slipped another pellet into his mouth. Help me get Dodd down, if this is our destination, answered Tommy. They lifted Dodd to the ground. He was conscious now and moaning for water. The two men carried him into a sort of large cavern, at the farther end of which the fire was roaring. Bram went to a spring that trickled down one side, filled something that looked like a petrified lily calyx, and brought it to Dodd, who drained it. Tommy looked about him. He was astonished to see that the place was, in a way, furnished. Bram had carved out a very creditable couch and several low chairs, evidently with a stone axe, for by the light of the fire, which cast a fair illumination even at that distance, Tommy could see the marks of the implement, rough and irregular in the wood. On the ground were thick rugs, woven of hair, and two or three more rugs of the same material lay on the couch. It was evident that the human herd was expected to furnish textile materials as well as meat. "'Sit down and make yourself comfortable,' said Bram when they had raised Dodd to the couch. We'll have dinner, and then we'll talk. I can give you a fine vegetarian meal. Those dirty shrimp-eating savages look on me as a cannibal because I eat the fruit of the trees, he grinned. There's a bad shortage of food in Submundia, as I've named this part of the world, he went on, for until I came the beetle simply devoured the humans wholesale, instead of breeding them like I taught them. And there's another of the hundred and fifty-year swarms due to hatch out soon. However, we'll talk about that later. And all those fine fruits going to waste. Excuse me, Travers. He disappeared and returned in a minute or two with a small table, piled high with luscious fruits unknown to Tommy, though among them were some that looked like loaves of natural bread. Tommy, whose appetite never failed him, even in the worst circumstances, fell to with a will. He was enjoying his meal when he happened to look up and saw that the penumbra at the edge of the lighted zone was dense with beetles. Thousands, perhaps millions, for they stretched away as far as the eye could see, were packed together, their antenna waving in unison, their heads beneath the shells directed toward the fire. Bram saw Tommy's look of disgust and laughed. The fire seems to intoxicate them, Travers, he said. They always throng the entrance when I'm here. It's as far as they dare go. They're quite blind in the least light. Care to smoke? I've learned the art of making some quite decent cigars. He produced a handful. Oh, by the way, you didn't see my lighter anywhere, did you? he went on, with a pretense of carelessness. No, lied Tommy. I was surprised you— Oh, there's a supply of petrol on the rocks, no matter, answered Bram carelessly. Your friend looks bad, he added, glancing at Dodd, who had fallen asleep. Travers, I'm sorry I lost my temper. The, the shock of meeting men from the upper world, you know. Dodd opened his eyes and tried to whisper. Tommy bent over him and listened. "'He wants to know whether he can have that girl to take care of him,' he said. "'What? The one I saw you with? Why, she's a call, Travers.' "'What do you mean?' asked Tommy. "'Why, useless, you know. There's several of them running loose. 
and waiting to be rounded up. We raised two breeds, one for replenishing the stock and one for meat. She's a call. A reversion, no use for either purpose. I'll have her brought by all means. I, I like Dodd. I want to get him to like me, Bram went on, with a sort of penitence that had a pathetic touch. Our little differences, quite absurd, and I can prove he's wrong in his ideas. Make yourselves comfortable as long as you're here, Travers, and don't mind me. Only don't try to escape. The beetles will get you if you do, and there's no way out of here, none that you'll find. And don't try to follow me. But you're a sensible man, and we'll all get along famously, I'm sure, as soon as Dodd recovers. End of Part 3